equipping the saints. Come as you are, but don't stay as you are. Naturally supernatural. If you've been around the vineyard movement of churches, which is our church denomination, our extended family within the family that is the body of Christ, you will hear phrases such as these. So today we are launching our new sermon series, which we are calling Vineyard Values. And we're going to look at a bunch of different phrases such as the ones I just mentioned. And these values, these phrases, each inform our faith and our practice. Each short saying being distilled from scripture to help us to together follow Jesus. So before we get started, I'm going to lay out a simple roadmap of where we're going today. And there's going to be three stops along our journey today. One, the vineyard. Two, the Holy Spirit. And three, come Holy Spirit. So, number one, the vineyard. Well, we might wonder why would we spend any time talking about our denominational beliefs, practices, theology, or traditions. Now, there's a vi there are very good reasons to do that. Anyone want to guess how many denominations there are in the world today? 1,500? Go higher. That's a very specific number. Thank you. Higher. <laughs> do even higher, believe it or not, there are over 45,000 Christian denominations globally. And every single one of these, every theological tradition is both systematic and complex. And they have a way of seeing the Christian faith as a whole. None of us arrived on earth during the short time that Jesus walked among us. We each received the Christian faith as it was transmitted to us through scripture and through the church. And in particular, as followers of Christ, we each received the Christian faith through those individuals and churches and ministries who proclaimed and demonstrated the good news of Jesus to us in word and in deed. And we can each thank God for and share stories about individuals, families, churches, and ministries who were influential in each of our journeys of faith. And Tamara, you mentioned you're a sweet mom today. So we each can think of people who have influenced us, and we thank God for each of them. Because, you know, all Christians tell, teach, sing, and show the same gospel story, but each faith, within each faith tradition, we have our own characteristic styles and emphases. Now, some things that happen in church may make us feel very uncomfortable, especially when we don't understand or expect them. You may have had that experience if you visited a church that is far, fairly far away from your own faith tradition that you're used to. And some things that happen in church may make us feel right at home. Just as we each have a family heritage that is often complicated, where we like to emphasize some parts, embrace some parts, celebrate some parts, other parts we would prefer to forget, ignore, or discard. We also have a theological heritage and viewpoint. Now, here at Liberty Vineyard, we anchor our Christian faith in the beliefs, practices, theology, and traditions of the Vineyard Movement. And the Vineyard Movement itself is anchored within the beliefs, practices, theology, and traditions of what we call the Orthodox Christian faith. So we trace our lineage right back to the apostles and the creeds. So, as followers of Christ, you and I are here on a journey. We have arrived, each of us has arrived right where we are here and now, not as disoriented strangers, but as pilgrims in familiar lands we, where we can recognize old landmarks and remain alert 
for new and unseen discoveries. So our vineyard beliefs, practices, theology, and traditions guide us in our conversations with scripture. We have a pleasant camaraderie with other Christian pilgrims with whom we share the, ce the central and most important things. And yet, we have differing lenses through which to view secondary things. So we seek to walk in the wisdom of this well-known 17th century quote, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. So we make ourselves present to other Christ followers who are present with us and with those who have gone before. When we interact with other saints, whether in person or through their writings, we experience the unity and the joy of the body of Christ. And in humility, we can acknowledge that no person or group alone can see, know, understand, or practice the fullness of the gospel perfectly. So that's all a big introduction as to why we're studying vineyard values. Okay, <laughs> that was a long introduction. So now we're going to move to second, the second stop of our journey, the Holy Spirit. So I want to read two paragraphs from the Vineyard Statement of Faith. And if you're interested, we have the Statement of Faith in entirety on our Liberty Vineyard website. And this section that I'm going to read is entitled, The Ministry of the Holy Spirit. We believe that the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church at Pentecost in power, baptizing believers into the body of Christ and releasing the gifts of the Spirit to them. The Spirit brings the permanent indwelling presence of God to us for spiritual worship, personal sanctification, building up the church, gifting us for ministry, and driving back the kingdom of Satan by the evangelization of the world through proclaiming the word of Jesus and doing the works of Jesus. We believe that the Holy Spirit indwells every believer in Jesus Christ and that he is our abiding helper, teacher, and guide. We believe in the filling of or the empowering of the Holy Spirit, often a conscious experience for ministry today. We believe in the present ministry of the Spirit and in the exercise of all of the biblical gifts of the Spirit. We practice the laying on of hands for the empowering of the Spirit, for healing, and for recognition and empowering of those whom God has ordained to lead and serve the church. Now, if you go to this statement of faith, you will see after every one of these sections a lot of scripture references. And I invite you to go there and visit those um, there's many, many ref scriptures to accompany these paragraphs. So you probably recognize some of the phrases. They all come out of scripture as we see and understand scripture through our vineyard lenses founded on Orthodox Christian beliefs. So we're going to just look at two short scriptures among those many that were listed to see what we notice and learn about the Holy Spirit. So the first one is an Old Testament one, Joel 2, 28, just one verse. It's a familiar promise. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Now, as with any scripture, anything that we read in the ancient world, but especially with scripture, we want to go back to the people to whom it was written and under, to help us to understand what was being said, how were they hearing it, how were they understanding it. So this is something interesting when, I don't know if you, if you imagine, well, what would the hearers have thought? So when Joel wrote this prophecy, it was well known and understood by the people of God that God did pour out his spirit on people, but only in a limited way. They knew that someone 
who was filled with the Spirit, had been chosen, appointed, and anointed by God in a special way. So it would not have been surprising to the readers to whom the prophecies of Joel were originally written that when the Spirit of God is poured out, there will be revelation, especially through dreams and visions. They expected that. That was not a surprise at all to the readers. But what would have... So every time God's Spirit was poured out on someone, they fully expected revelation to follow. But what would have been very surprising and almost unimaginable would have been that there would be a day when God would pour out his spirit on all flesh, all humanity, all persons. And this is where we find ourselves in God's story. We're living as we are in between Acts chapter 2 and Christ's second coming. And this era in which we live is actually sometimes referred to as the age of the Holy Spirit. That's our first scripture. Second scripture comes from the New Testament, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. All right, so these are the words of Jesus shortly before his ascension. And Jesus is speaking here of what would happen when Joel's prophecy was fulfilled. And as we know from our previous sermon series, is it the one we just finished? It's been a long week. <laughs> um, <laughs> I should know these things. Anyway, two series ago, I think. Anyway, we, we just went through the whole book of Acts. This is one of the most widely known pieces of Acts, that on the day of Pentecost, God poured out his Holy Spirit, and that was when the church was born. The spectacular growth of the early church was not due to savvy promotion, growth principles. It's kind of laughable to think about that or even eloquent preaching. It was because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And whenever the Holy Spirit comes upon followers of Christ, we receive power, which enables us to do what Acts 1.8 says, enables us to be Christ's witnesses wherever we go. This means that we actually become part of, of the good news of Jesus Christ because we are empowered and sent by the Holy Spirit. There is so much that we could say today about the Holy Spirit. We could do an entire series that would go for years and never mind the depths of the Holy Spirit. But today we're going to focus on what we call Holy Spirit gifts and fruits. Now, you and I and others we know may have heard a variety of teachings about these things over the years. We may have even done gift tests to try to figure out who we are, what gifts we've been given, how to operate in those gifts, and so forth. So no matter where we fall on the spectrum of belief about who can receive these and when, without getting tangled up in theological knots, I'd like to paint some broad strokes that I hope we will each find helpful. There are three major groupings which can be helpful in describing the work of the Holy Spirit. So the first main section you can see there, the gift, gifts of the Holy Spirit. This is different from what you or I might have heard when we talk about the gifts of the Spirit there's, there's two different ways we can use the word gift, so bear with me if this seems a little bit unfamiliar. The gifts of the Holy Spirit is what the church at large has called for a long time what is given in Isaiah 11, 1 to 3. And these direct both our intellect and our will toward God. So I've taken the words that are often used and then tried to unpack it a little bit. So the first one is wisdom, and wisdom is a gift given to us to illumine our minds and attract us to God. 
the Holy Spirit gifts us with understanding, and that is to connect so that we would be able to connect all truths with God's purposes and to further our understanding of Scripture. The Holy Spirit gifts us with counsel to enable us to judge rightly and to see the will of God. There's a, here's a word we don't hear every day, but the Holy Spirit gives us with fortitude, which is to give us firmness of mind to be able to do good and endure evil. The Holy Spirit gifts us with knowledge to enable us to perceive things from God's perspective. The Holy Spirit gifts us with piety to be able to live with reverence for and in total reliance on God. And the Holy Spirit gifts us with the fear of the Lord, and that is to grow aware of the glory and majesty of God. Now, if you like reading the the um, the saints, the writings of the saints, which is anyone who's in Christ before now, they're already they've already gone to be with the Lord. There are many, many writings for the first fifteen, sixteen hundred years that talk about these seven things. So this is this is not something that I just pulled out of Scripture. Thomas Aquinas wrote extensively about this. Many other writers wrote about this, and um, you may have heard of the seven virtues, the seven deadly sins. These are the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of sevens in the early church writings. And when I say early, the first 1,500 years. <laughs> anyway, um, so the next section, which we've probably heard many times and um, thought about, and it's often brought up, is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And these are referenced in Galatians 5, 22 to 23. Now, sometimes people say the fruits of the Holy Spirit, but the Greek word is actually a singular word, the fruit. It's a singular term that describes nine attributes of a person or community living in accord with the Holy Spirit. So love, which is unconditional benevolence. Joy being distinguished from human happiness, it's joy in God. Peace, which is contentedness in all circumstances. Patience is refusing to avenge oneself. These are, these are, thing, these are meanings that are drawn out of the Greek. I don't usually think of patience that way, but it's, it's an invitation to consider these from a different facet, perhaps. Kindness is repaying go evil with good. Goodness is showing mercy to sinners. Faithfulness, which is overcoming temptation. Gentleness, which is non-violence. And self-control, which is obedience unto death. And then our third and final section is what we often think of as the spiritual gifts. We hear this term, and the word, the Greek word here is charism. So the charisms, we get our word charismatic. And these are extraordinary or supernatural grace and power given to individual Christians for the common good to build up the entire church. Now, I wanted to, us to pay attention that the first two lists describe what the Spirit pours out on the whole church, not just individuals. Every, everyone partakes of all of those. Now, this third group, we don't all partake of all of these. We don't, I, I don't know if the word partake is right, but we, we tend to not practice or see every one of these charisms in every believer. So that's just a distinction to notice. And there are several lists in the New Testament, including 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, and 1 Peter 4, that include these spiritual gifts. Prophecy, leading, teaching, service, exhortation, giving, mercy, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, increased faith, 
gifts of healing, working of miracles, visions, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues, helps, governing, and others. There are many. And that brings us to the end of our second stop along the journey, the final one, come Holy Spirit. Now, I realize that all this is such a lot to take in. I've read these passages many times in my life, and yet the Lord quickened several things to me this week in particular. We had just remembered the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on Monday, and I was really drawn to the idea that Holy Spirit gentleness has to do with non-violence. So I've kind of camped on that this week. And as I felt frustrated and angry this week when I read about some of the evil being perpetrated in the world, I was awakened to a deeper understanding that Holy Spirit fortitude includes not only doing good, but enduring evil, which is not just a passive endurance, it's kind of that grit that refuses to give up even in the face of great evil. And as I admired, it's hard to remember it today, but it's sunny outside now, but on Wednesday when I woke up and looked outside, there was this dazzling and delicate early morning frost, and it was a decidedly wintry day on Wednesday, and I was encouraged to notice that the fear of the Lord is a Holy Spirit gift that draws us ever deeper into wonder. And I hadn't thought of it in exactly those terms. And so I want to encourage you too to spend some time this week just meditating on these lists, on these gifts and, and the fruit. Just sit with the Lord with these and allow the Lord to highlight to you and allow the Holy Spirit to pour into you whatever the Holy Spirit desires. And it's important, as important as it is to know who the Holy Spirit is, it's also crucial to invite and welcome the Holy Spirit to do whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do. Okay, we, we know that. So our, our phrase, our vineyard value, is also a prayer. Come, Holy Spirit. We need a constant filling of the Holy Spirit. You know, there's a... Scripture in the New Testament says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, the, the Greek has a tense in it. We don't really have this in English exactly. We have to say a lot of words. They can say it in one word. Be continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not a one-time thing. It's a continual because, I, you know, we leak. I walk out in the parking lot. I've already leaked out whatever <laughs> I've received because we're just fickle and fragile people. I know I am. So this come Holy Spirit is a prayer. Lord, come, fill me, fill us again. And it's, a, a, it's an invitation for the Spirit to touch us again. So in a couple of minutes, we're going to have a Holy Spirit clinic. It's not like a medical clinic. It's, it's more like just we're going to set aside space in which we will practice doing just that. We're going to pray, come Holy Spirit. So right before we do that, I want to close with two important reminders. Whenever we pray, come Holy Spirit, let's remember these two things. And they're both from 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 4.20 The kingdom of God depends not on talk, but on power. So when we pray, come Holy Spirit, we're asking God. We're asking the Holy Spirit to come in power because we don't have it. We can't change the world by our talk. And then 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 2. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. 
And so there we see the Apostle Paul mentioning a bunch of the gifts of the Spirit, the ones that we often are like, wow, but we can have all of these things. We can operate in all of these things, but if we lack love, then we're not in accord with the Holy Spirit. And so we, when we pray, Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, we're asking, come, show us your power and your love and help us to operate in your power and in your love. All right, so I'm going to close us here by praying. We're going to pause right now. We're going to pray, come Holy Spirit, and then I invite you, just listen, notice, and be bold. Whatever the Holy Spirit, I have no idea what's going to happen. The Holy Spirit always wants to us to cry out to him. God longs for us to long for him as we have all through the service today. So let's pray. Come Holy Spirit.